Well, it is uh, still the Easter season, so uh, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Uh, Friends, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Gabe, and uh, I get to be one of the pastors here at ULC, and I'm excited to to share God's word with you today. So in uh, 722, 722 A.D., uh, a priest named Boniface uh, was, was sent, was commissioned uh, to go into what is modern-day Eastern Germany. Uh, and he was sent there to, to share the gospel with the, the pagan Germanic tribesmen uh, that lived in that region of the world at that time. Uh, and so he arrives there, uh, and he, he sort of scopes out the situation. He discovers uh, that, that in the midst of this area stood this great oak tree, this giant oak tree uh, that was sacred to the god Thunor. Uh, and the god Thunor was, was essentially the Germanic equivalent to the Norse god Thor. Uh, you, you know Thor, right? The hammer, the, the goat-drawn chariots. Uh, you've all seen Avengers, right? You, you know the type. And, uh, and Boniface uh, sees this oak associated with Thunor. And he, he sees Thunor's oak. And he goes up to it, and he pulls out an axe. I don't know where he got it from. Pulls out an axe, and he starts chopping down this tree in front of all these Germanic tribes people. And as he's chopping down this tree, he claims... Uh, that the resurrected Jesus has triumphed over Thunor. And as the oak fell, Boniface was not struck by lightning. The earth did not swallow him. He was not killed by outraged locals. And so this stump ended up serving as proof of what Boniface had been claiming, that Christ had indeed triumphed over Thunor. Then Boniface then used the wood from that oak tree to build a church. Now, I'll tell you that story. Uh, in contemporary missiology, uh, it is discouraged to go to a place and desecrate sacred sites and pronounce the triumph of Christ, right? Uh, you, what you want to do is you want to first understand the culture, serve them, share the gospel graciously. But I think we actually see in the story of Boniface, in the harsh world of late antiquity, what he did was actually quite effective. It was quite effective that this stump of the oak of Thunor was, was a powerful symbol that actually led to the conversion of many of these Germanic tribes people to Christianity. And then years later, as Boniface continued his missionary work, he was in Frisia, which is uh, modern-day Netherlands, uh, and there was a morning where, where he was set to, to baptize a bunch of new people who were, were converting to the Christian faith. Uh, and as he's getting ready to baptize them, a boat shows up on the shore that is filled with pirates. His pirates come and they attack Boniface and his community. And instead of fighting back, uh, Boniface cited the example of Christ telling St. Peter to put his sword away. And Boniface in that moment then thanked God for this hour of his release. And then he was brutally cut to pieces. That's the end of the story. Now, I love this story. Uh, I love the story of St. Boniface because on the one hand, you look at that first part, him and the, the oak of Thunor, like, dude's got so much swagger. Right? Like he just shows up and is like, I'm not even afraid. Just goes for it. So much courage chops down the oak of Thunor. Uh, on the other hand, we notice he doesn't use that courage to do violence against his enemies, but instead uses that courage to suffer violence with a surprising amount of peace. Now, why does he do that? Like, like where does that come from? Uh, well, in his book, Dominion, the historian Tom Holland, not Spider Man, a different Tom Holland, 8 a.m. did not like it as much. Okay. Um, (laughs) Writes, as vividly as anyone, he, Boniface, understood what it was to be born again. The old is gone, the new has come. The tone of revolution in Paul's cry. The sense that an entire order had been judged and found wanting. Still retained a freshness for men like Boniface. As a West Saxon, a man whose people had only lately been brought to Christ, stood in awe of it. He suffered no anxiety in contemplating the world turned upside down. Quite the opposite. Taking to the roads, he felt himself called to serve just as Paul had once served, as an agent of disruption. So what Holland says here is that Boniface saw what life in Christ had done for his people. Boniface experienced what life in Christ had done for him. That he saw and experienced the freedom from the futility and from the violence and from the fear of life lived under the gods of his ancestors. And he longed for all people to experience the freedom of life in Christ. 
That Boniface saw a better way, and so he was then sent to proclaim the peace and the forgiveness that are found in the resurrected Jesus. And friends, that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, Today we're we're starting a new sermon series uh, focusing on the resurrection of Jesus this Easter season. Uh, Because I don't know if you know this, so Lent is 40 days leading up to Easter. We have Easter, and then we have 50 days of celebrating Easter. All right, so, so we're still in it, baby, all right? And so we're, we're in this series called He is Risen. We're going to look at Jesus' resurrection appearances to his followers in the Gospel of John. Easter Sunday, we looked at, at John 21 through 18, and we're just going to finish the entire book. Uh, because here's why. There's, we have this fundamental belief as Christians, absolutely fundamental belief as Christians, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the single most important day in the entire history of the world. Resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the single most important day in the history of the entire world. It is the fundamental claim at the center of the Christian faith. Uh, So much so that if it didn't happen, if it didn't happen, I will get down off this chancel and I will race you to go get Moses somewhere. All right? But because it did happen, because Christ is risen from the dead, that changes everything. That after Jesus rose from the dead for 40 days, he he appeared to his followers and it changed everything for them. That we'll see in our text for today, they they go from a small group of terrified people hiding behind locked doors to leaders of a movement that would proclaim the resurrection of Jesus from India to Spain in their lifetime. And that just two generations later, they would end up conquering the entire Roman Empire with the gospel without lifting a weapon. And then the craziest thing of all is that today, 2,000 years later, from sub-Saharan Africa to the rainforests of Brazil to the metropolises of China, even to a college town in the Midwestern United States, the resurrected Jesus is still changing lives today. Because he is risen. Oh, all right. Wasn't even planning that. Whoa. <laughs> Spicy today, Lutherans. All right, all right. It's good, it's good. Oh, I needed that. All right. This would be a much better sermon now. You have no idea. Uh, he's alive. All right, so, and so today what we're doing is we're looking at just how Boniface was sent. Uh, Jesus, in fact, still sends his people today. That he is risen to send us. And so here's our outline this morning. We see that there's fear, there's peace, that you are sent. There's fear, there's peace, you are sent. So let's get into it. Look with me at our first verse for today. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. All right, so let's dig into this. All right, so it says in this text that it's the evening of Easter Sunday which means Jesus has already risen from the dead, Uh, but the only person who's who's seen him so far is Mary Magdalene. Uh, And she either hasn't gotten a chance to tell the disciples yet, uh, or perhaps more likely, they just haven't believed her. Uh, And so so they're all scared. They're all scared of the religious authorities, scared of what they're going to do to them, and so they lock themselves in a room. And so we have to ask the question, like, like, why are they so scared? Like, what about this moment makes them so scared? Let's just think about it. The the disciples uh, were these these young people. They would have been about college aged, uh, student would have been about college student aged. Uh, But at this point in their life, they would have left behind their careers, left behind their families of origin, left behind their communities, left behind anything they had ever known in order to follow Jesus. Uh, Because they believed him to be the Messiah. They believed that he was God's anointed one, that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, that he's the one who was going to liberate them from the oppression of the Romans. And so they leave everything behind because of what they think Jesus is going to do, that he's going to conquer and he's going to win, and then by extension, they will win as well. But then, of course, just a few days before our text for today, Jesus' followers see him get crucified and die on a Roman cross. And so all of a sudden, they have to come to grips with the reality that they've backed the wrong horse. They don't know what to do. They picked the wrong guy. They tied themselves to the wrong movement. And now they find themselves on the wrong side of power. And so they're afraid. They're afraid, and so they lock themselves in a room. 
And if you'll indulge me, 945, uh, we're going to go down a, a cultural exegesis rabbit hole this morning. Uh, because I can't help but notice that I think we live in a time of fear as well. A time of fear in which many people, and perhaps many of us, in light of that fear, have locked ourselves up in rooms too, if you will. And I say that, I say we live in a time of fear, and of course there's the, the obvious sources of fear one might expect me to comment on, right? The coming through the pandemic, uh, the environment, the culture war, the war war, mass shootings, right? Like all of those absolutely uh, play a role in a sort of heightened anxiety in our daily lives. But what I want to get at today is I believe that actually underneath all of that uh, is a sort of existential fear that is actually spiritual in nature, that has many of us locked in our rooms, if you will. And so I'm going to try my very best to explain that existential fear. Uh, we will see how it goes, okay? I'm going to try and get a lot across in a very short amount of time, kind of poorly. So just like, you know, hang with me, 945. If not, it'll be over soon, okay? Uh, and if you don't like it, don't tell me. So let's get into it. Uh, so we have to start here. So, so my old seminary professor, Dr. Kolb, he would say that, that one's God, one's God is where someone finds their ultimate identity, meaning, and security. Okay, so whatever it is you say you believe about capital G God, uh, Dr. Kolb would say, wherever you find your ultimate identity, security, and meaning, that functionally is actually your lowercase g God. Okay, keep that in mind. That plus this next part. Uh, we talk about this quite a bit up here. Uh, but famously, the uh, philosopher Charles Taylor deemed our age a, a secular age. Uh, and what he meant by that is that we live life in what he calls an imminent frame. That our lives are lived in which in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, we typically find our ultimate identity, meaning, and security, not in God, but in this world only with no appeal to the transcendent or to supernatural forces. That's just sort of our everyday life is just to find those things in this world only. And so when that's the case, when we, when we have to seek our ultimate identity, security, and meaning, when we have to find a God in this world only, it kind of resorts to us finding a God within ourselves. And that is an incredible burden to bear. The Harvard uh, professor of philosophy, Sean Dorrance Kelly, puts it like this in his book, All Things Shining. He says, it is as if the true burden of this responsibility, the responsibility to escape from the meaninglessness and drudgery of a godless world by constructing a happier meaning for it out of nothing, literally ex nihilo, as God himself once had done, was too much for any human spirit to achieve. It is a possibility that requires us to become gods ourselves. And so what Kelly says here is that within the imminent frame of our secular age, we have to become gods ourselves. But as he notes, it's too much for us. We're not made for that. The human spirit can't take it. And so what happens is we find gods in other things. And so we collapse in on one of the, the isms of our day is what I want to call them. One of the isms of our day. Like here, here's an illustration from the author Jay Kim describing what this looks like. Okay, so he says these, these are the isms we find ourselves drawn to in, in absence of um, the transcendent. Individualism, which says everything is about me and for me. Pluralism, which says everything is true if I want it to be. Cynicism, which says everything is hopeless. Nihilism, which says everything is meaningless. Materialism says everything I want should be mine. Hedonism says everything should feel good. A quick disclaimer, I, I do think there are healthy forms of individualism and pluralism, but that's not his point here, and that's not my point. But notice in the middle what Kim has here. He says, obsessed, so obsessed with these isms, leads to possessed. His point here being that though in many ways we live as if there is no supernatural reality, he's arguing actually there is one, and it isn't all good. That in fact, as we cling to these isms, as we cling to the gods of our age, instead of liberating us as they promised, they actually end up enslaving us in fear. And this is actually demonstrable. See, that the result of lives built on these isms produces this. So these are the results of a poll taken this March uh, by Wall Street Journal and the National Opinion Research Center out of the University of Chicago on what values people in the U.S. say are, quote, very important to them. So they said, 
of these values, what are very important to you? And it's, it's tough to see, I know, but, but it says, uh, the first one there is patriotism, which of course can take good and bad forms. Uh, but that's down 61% in 2019, down to 38% in 2023. Religion, 48% in 2019, down to 39% in 2023. Having children, 43% in 2019, 30% in 2023. Community involvement, 62% in 2019 to 27% in 2023. And finally, money, 41% in 2019, up to 43% in 2023. What's the, the pattern we notice here? There's a very significant amount of change in four years. And the pattern we notice here is this, is that anything... Anything that would involve me divesting of myself for the sake of others is down. Anything that costs me something, anything that might be risky, anything that might cause me to get out from behind a screen and actually connect with another human being is down. It's down. And then the only thing that would, might give me some security, money, is up. What does that mean? We live in a profound time of fear. Of fear. We're absolutely gripped by fear, hiding behind locked doors in a room. And let me be clear, I'm, I'm not an old preacher up here lamenting the state of things. I am simply trying to articulate the reality we find ourselves in. This is just the reality we find ourselves in. We are gripped by fear, locked in our rooms. This is not just out there, this is many of us. Uh, in a recent Substack post, writer Freddie DeBoer puts it like this, all across our culture, you'll find people eager to abandon the fundamental task of our lives, fostering and maintaining human connection, so that they can fall deeper into a pit of hedonistic distraction forever. That's a sentence. Basic dynamic in life. There is nothing meaningful enough to make you happy that could not make you sad if you lost it. This is the paradox of feeling, and it's inherent and existential. If things inspire real positive emotion in you, then they are necessarily things in which you are sufficiently invested that you would feel negative emotions when they're gone. One of the fundamental choices that you face on earth is the degree to which you'll pursue deeper but riskier fulfillment or practice avoidance that exempts you from bad feelings but leaves you bereft of good ones. We all move in one direction or the other from one day to another, certainly including me, but it feels to me as if our society is decidedly embracing the latter. Depth and intensity of feeling risk, too much. Xbox and hard seltzer and HR culture anesthetize. When we're gripped by fear, we lock ourselves in rooms. Close ourselves off, don't want to risk human connection, don't want to risk connection with God, don't want to risk engagement with the world, don't want to break out of our rooms. And so the question then is, how's that been going for us? I would suggest not well. Not well. And if you find yourself kind of caught up in what I'm trying to get at this morning, how's that been going for you? My guess would be not well. But friends, there's, there's good news. Because what we see in our text is that locked doors do not stop Jesus. That fear does not stop Jesus. And that the powers of darkness do not stop the resurrected Jesus. He shows up. So look with me at our next verse. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So the disciples are hiding in fear behind locked doors. Jesus shows up. And as he speaks to his disciples, I love this, speaks to, as he speaks to them, what's the first thing he does? He shows them his hands, and he shows them his side. Like, think about this with me. Like Jesus has risen from the dead. He is victorious. He has conquered death. He has conquered the, conquered the principalities and powers of darkness. He took the worst this world has to offer, and he came out on top. He's shown up to see his disciples. His victory is now their victory. And as he shows up after achieving all of that, what does he do? Does he shoot laser beams out of his eyes? Lightning out of his fingertips. No. He shows him his wounds. He shows him his wounds. He shows him his scars. As if to say, my victory always comes through suffering. My victory always comes through death. And friends, in a time of fear, 
trapped in our rooms. Jesus shows up and says, victory through death is your invitation as well. Victory through death is your invitation as well. And it's actually that victory through death that releases you from fear. Because that victory through death is a death to ourselves. A death to ourselves that says, God is God and I am not. I'm going to trust him with my whole life. A death to ourselves that says, all the isms of our world are not working out. I won't fall for them anymore. A death to ourselves that says, I can't solve all the problems of this world. I can't even solve all the problems in my own life. But God sent Jesus to face the worst this world has to offer on my behalf. And he's already won. And his victory is my victory. And so there's nothing I need to fear. He is in control. A death to ourselves that says, instead of living trapped in fear, I'm going to trust in the peace that the resurrected Jesus offers me. We only get out of fear by dying to ourselves and rising to live in the new life Christ offers us. Look with me at our next verse. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So this is the second time, I don't know if you know, the second time Jesus has said, peace be with you to his disciples. That the first two words out of Jesus' mouth post-resurrection to his disciples are peace, peace. Now generally when we think of the term peace, I think we likely think of it as like the absence of conflict or we think about a sort of inner calm, a sort of inner peace. And those are certainly aspects of peace. Uh, but the peace that these first disciples would have understood, would have heard, uh, is the peace from the scriptures. It's much more holistic than that. That uh, peace in the scriptures is most fully understood in the, the Hebrew word shalom, right? And shalom, of course, is, is not merely the absence of conflict or some inner sense of calm, uh, but shalom is about God's healing rule and reign being on earth as it is in heaven. It's the hungry being fed. It's the sick being healed. It's the fearful being set free, it's the sinner being forgiven. It's the idea, shalom is the idea of the world as it's meant to be. And so as the resurrected Jesus appears to his disciples, he's saying this peace, this shalom has begun through me and I'm giving it to you and I'm sending you out with it. That Jesus says this peace has begun through me, I've brought it to you, and now I'm sending you out with it. In the midst of fear, Jesus brings peace and then sends us out. And I can't help but notice that this is the very nature of the church. This is what it is to be church. Like, ULC does not exist as an end in itself. We don't exist as an end in ourselves. We exist to be sent we receive the peace of Christ, and then he sends us out. To receive the peace of Christ and then to be sent out to extend that peace to a hurting and fearful world is what each one of you is invited into. But hear this, you aren't set alone. Look with me at our final two verses. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So as Jesus sends his church out, he, he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit and he gives us a word to speak, the word of forgiveness, of peace with God. Now, historically in the church, we, we call this commission by Jesus here uh, the office of the keys, fancy name, the office of the keys, that in this moment, what Jesus is doing is actually instituting the fundamental work of his church, the fundamental work of the church is to proclaim the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. That's our fundamental job. And then actually, as Lutheran Christians, we believe that the fundamental function of the pastor, like my fundamental job, is to proclaim the forgiveness of sins over God's people again and again and again. Like it, this is my job description. You, you saw it. There it is, very short, very short. Uh, but that's it. Proclaim the forgiveness of sins over God's people again and again. Why? Like, why, why would God say, hey, this is, this is the main gig, and then this is why I want these yahoos to stand up front and tell people they're forgiven over and over again? Why? It's so that we are saturated with the grace of Christ, so that as we go out to extend the peace of Christ, we do it absolutely covered in the grace of God. We need that. 
And so friends, hear that word of forgiveness again. That there is a God who loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus into this world to give of himself on the cross for you that you might be forgiven. That nothing in this world, that nothing you've done or haven't done, no fear nor anxiety can separate you from his love. That Christ's work for you on the cross and in the empty tomb is total and complete and finished and you are forgiven and set free. It's just true. Now friends, you grab hold of that. You actually grab hold of that. It erases fear and it sends you out. It sends you out. Let me close with a confession of sorts. As I was Prepping this message, and really honestly for the last couple of months, I've, I felt kind of, because we're not sent alone, I felt kind of convicted by the Spirit uh, that, that I've kind of locked myself in, in a room. Instead of being sent out with the gospel, I've, I've found myself like, man, am I part of those stats that, that I shared earlier? That we talk about having a, a sent posture here at ULC. Uh, that that I, I just am looking at my life, I'm like, I don't think I've really embodied that lately. Because the reality is I, I, I like this. Like, I like the safety and security of a growing church where I get to spend half of my sermon just talking about philosophers and stats, and everyone's like, I don't even know what that part was about. Uh, It's fun. And obviously, I think, like, that's a fine thing to do. But at the end of the day, I'm just convicted, like, it's not the end goal. It's not the end goal. At the end of the day, friends, we've been given a message that the world actually needs that Ann Arbor actually needs, that the University of Michigan actually needs, like, like actually. Like there are oaks of Thunor, if you will, enslaving people in fear all around us, and we've got the only ax that can chop that down and set people free. And so the good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection is actually good news. Do you know what? It's, it's actually good news. And that you are sent to proclaim it. Death has been defeated. Sin has been atoned for. There is life found in the name of Jesus, and you are sent to proclaim it. And I don't have some big call to action, though you can join Andrew at Emmaus. highly recommend it. But friends, would you join me in this moment? That maybe God stirred something in your heart this morning. Would you join me with, it, with it, just a conviction in your heart that says, God, would you release fear and send me. God, would you just open my eyes? And would you send me to proclaim your grace to those that need to hear it? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you meet us in our fear. You meet us in our anxieties. And you bring us your peace. Because Jesus, you've conquered the grave. You have the victory forever. Jesus, teach us to trust that truth, to receive that. And from that place, Lord, would you send us out? Would you open our eyes to where we need to go, to what we need to do? Send us out to proclaim.